Hey, hello, how are you? It's good to see you. You look fabulous. For those of you who have not been engulfed, and hi, there's Olivia, my daughter. Olivia, say hello. Come here, come on. You're screwing up my take here, but not say hello. So, so look right there and say hello. 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 okay. Hey, for those of you who have not been engulfed in the... For those of you who have not been engulfed in the Bamani Jones media onslaught, he is one of the stars of ESPN's Dan Lebetard is highly questionable, as well as, of course, Around the Horn. Additionally, he has his own show on ESPN Radio, now moved 4P to 7P East Coast time, big time slot for a big time star. As you can imagine, this highly talented gentleman never seems to stop. He once actually one day slept for three hours. It's unbelievable. Otherwise, he never sleeps. Doesn't at all. Nope, doesn't happen. So we started there. That's where the conversation started. Owen Murphy, Bamani Jones, take it away. From the perspective of someone like me who doesn't follow you around all day, all day and doesn't really know you as well as maybe those who work with you. What on? I'll, I'll flip on ESPN and there you are. Then I'll flip on ESPN too and there you are. Listen <laughs> to the radio and there you are. What on earth is a day in the life like for Bamani Jones? You know, it's actually not quite as like hectic as one might think. I mean, it's busy, but not so much hectic. So, you know, um, we're going to start doing the 4 o'clock radio show pretty soon. But I do a 10.30 call uh, for Highly Questionable where we get the rundown set for the show. I go about 12 or so, go get lunch. We tape Highly Questionable, I guess at about 1.15, give or take. Um, Knock that out. If I've got Around the Horn, I do Around the Horn from the same studio right after that. And then when I've had the radio show at nine, I think anybody who does radio gets this. It's hard to like rest until you got your show set. So the rest of the day just entirely depends on do I have six topics? Like if I got six topics, if I got five, I'm pretty confident I can do a show. If I got four, it's going to take some magic. If I've got six, I got nothing to worry about. So then being on at four o'clock is better for your life, it sounds like. Well, yeah, getting off at 7 o'clock. I hadn't gotten off at 11 o'clock from work uh, since I was in college, and I don't quite have the build anymore for starting my day at 9 o'clock in the morning and then ending it at 11. That's a bit much. Yeah, yeah. All right, so tell me how you are going to take this radio program and make it unique and different and your own. Well, I would say for me, the biggest thing is I've never been really that caught up in a lot of window dressing around radio. Like, I feel like every show that you do kind of takes on its own life. Like, with the operation that you work at, the producer that you work with, like, all of these things, they kind of organically come together, and they become the show that you're going to have. So, like, every radio show I've done has been different, really based upon who the producer was, because the producer can expand or restrict whatever it is that you can do. And I've got the producer that I want working on this show that I've worked with for many years. So that's that part for me is very important. But I think the starting point on making it unique is I don't think very many people look at sports in the way that I look at sports. And I think it's a little more difficult to figure out what angle I'm going to take on something than most would probably think. So to start in the very beginning, this is going to be very personality driven radio. Um, you know, I'll start coming up with conceits for recurring segments and things like that kind of sort of as we go along. But from the very beginning, the biggest difference is I legitimately don't believe for better or worse that there's anybody quite like me on radio. I, I'm not sure there's anybody quite like you, period, actually. But that's a, <laughs> and that's a compliment. That's a good thing. I mean, unique is important, right? Um, it's in the media. Um, so, so you said uh, you talked about how you look at sports. How do you look at sports? Well, it's a combination of a couple of things. One, um, I just don't think these things are that serious, like from the very beginning. I think like the biggest danger that we make in sports is that we try to find something important in everything, right? Like no matter what the angle is, so we just had a game on Sunday night. It's like, okay, so what's the story from the game? And then we go and we take the story and then we run with it. So like one advantage about four o'clock in the afternoon is the story will be set, right? Like all the people that are talking about it, the story will be set. It's kind of the remix where the fun comes in, like the ancillary things that kind of shoot off of that one or where the fun comes. So, yeah, sometimes if you got Russell Wilson throwing an interception at the goal line in the Super Bowl, for example, that one is certainly the story right there. More fun is imagine Marshawn Lynch walking into the locker room and what's on his mind. Like those are the things that I like, I think are more important to explore. There's some big macro issue that's fine, but there's always something fun that's yeah. in there. There's always something in the background of a picture that's really funny if you blow the thing up. And I, I try to blow the picture up as much as anything else. So you're, you're, you're describing uh, Marshawn at, after the Super Bowl. Uh, after he's just run four and a half yards and almost scored, and, and they, they tripped him at the last second. He probably would have scored otherwise. 
uh, and he's walking to the locker room, and the thought process going through his head is Daryl Bevel, the offensive coordinator, has uh, asked Russell Wilson to, to throw a quick slant to uh, some guy no one's ever heard of before. Right. Um, so uh, would that become – just a, a a conversation on your show with your producer? Would that be a bit that you guys would produce up? What would you do with that? Well, I would think, like, for one, it, it could be a conversation. Like, the very beginning, I think, of all of these things is conversation. I think that people, by and large, like conversational radio. They want to feel like they're talking to somebody who is speaking with them, right? Mm -hmm. So with that sort of topic, maybe we blow it up. Maybe, like, maybe it becomes a thing, just the back and forth level of conversation. Maybe you think about other people who have been in the same sort of situation and create some parallel experience that a listener can then relate to because everybody's got some team that's done something stupid like this. And then you can connect there and then boom, they've got their thing that they know when it, it becomes a little realer for them in their sporting existence. And then there's just like the general funny of Marshawn Lynch all week, not talking to anybody and everybody wanting to talk to him. And then after the game, who wants to be the person to run up on Marshawn Lynch and ask that question first? The answer, nobody. Yeah. Nobody at all. Like, I imagine no one, hardly anybody was complaining about Marshawn Lynch not wanting to talk to him after that one because they have no idea what's going to wind up happening next. Because so it's the Super Bowl. It's huge. It's weighty. It's big. People have been betting money on it. Everything else. And then there's just the hilarious thought of Marshawn Lynch. Like, man, this is some nonsense, bro. Like, it's right there, you know? And everybody's been in a situation like that in life. And so it's how can you find the connection on that that not everybody is talking about but still stays in a place that everybody resides? Okay, so this isn't really a sports radio question. It's a sports question. Daryl Bevel says he, st he still was happy with the play call. Pete Carroll said he's happy with the play call. But Monty Jones, right play call, wrong play call, H hand the ball off to Marshawn Lynch or throw the ball to a – it was a locket. I can't remember who the, who the was, receiver yeah. was. Oh, you had the ball off, I think. Of course, like, no you had the ball yeah, off. Yeah, I think I think you had the ball off. But the thing I love about Pete, though, is they handed the ball to Lindell White on fourth and two in that Rose Bowl. They didn't get it. Texas went back the other way. You asked Pete after the game, I'd make the same call. Sometimes the decisions you make are not going to work. Like, sure. I thought that there, there was a case for throwing the ball. I thought that there was a case. I wouldn't have done it, That's but at right. least there was a case. <laughs> Well, you can imagine what that was like just a block away here, <laughs> surrounded by Seahawks fans. I literally said to my friend Toby, so they'll just hand the ball off. To, before They'll hand the ball off to Marshall Lynch, game in hand, boom, done. What, and then, so like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> <laughs> we did something on uh, Highly Questionable. I forget what. I think it was the, the Deadliest Catch Show or whatever, and they had the guys on the boat, and they were listening to the game. It was a bunch of guys from Seattle, and it showed them on the boat listening, not even to the game, but to somebody on a walkie-talkie telling them what was happening. Oh, my goodness. Right, so it, it was an interception. He threw an interception. And so, like, everyone's just like, the guy telling them is coming to grips with it, and then they have to come to grips with it and, you know, not be eaten by these deadly catches. All right, sports radio cliches that you, Bamani Jones, either like or dislike. You can go either way. I don't want to put any uh, um, my own opinion on things. But, like, you, you, I'm assuming you listen to a, a fair amount of sports talk radio in the past 15, 20 years. What do you like? What don't you like? What are the cliches that you embrace or don't embrace? Yeah, I think it's interesting. Like, I, the one, and I don't know if callers are a cliche necessarily, a but cr crutch maybe. Well, I have a, there, it's a dilemma for me because I want to have callers. I like to have callers because they become, the audience feels represented by the callers. And the callers are often asking the questions that they have. And, some, and the callers are there as an enforcement mechanism. Like, if I've got something wrong, a caller could come in and explain to me what I've got wrong. Like, if I'm wrong, I'm good with it. If you explain to me I'm wrong, I think that also was a little bit of a victory for people who are listening and get tired of the know-it-all host, right? <laughs> like, like I once I did a segment many years ago um, this is when LeBron was going to Miami and everybody was saying they're going to win 70 something games. And I gave this long articulate thing on why they would not win 70 games. And a guy called in from Oklahoma and said, I mean, I'm just saying if they want 66 games with the dudes in Cleveland, I don't see why they can't win 70 in Miami. And I end the segment with, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you spend 11 minutes laying out a case to be taken down in one sentence by some guy that you've never met before. Right. So That's great. like it's, you know, so like the call to action to callers where it's just like, so tell me what you think about this issue or who's your favorite coach of all time or yeah. da 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 and stuff like that. Like those things I don't like, but I love great callers. Like if you can find a way to curate your callers in such a way, that's fantastic. Like that's one I'm not a big fan of. I'm not big on lists also. Like, you know, when, when people, you know, we're going to talk about our favorite sports movies the of Mount all time. Mount Rushmore of uh, yes. quarterbacks, right? Right, like once yeah. that happens and there is no right answer, we're basically saying I'm going to turn on these phone lines and I'm going to put my feet up and I'm just going to hang out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, do you use uh, callers on your radio show? 
I actually, this show with ESPN, I haven't been able to because I don't have the call screener in my location. The call screener is in Bristol. I am here. My producer is in North Carolina. So I don't really, right, we're doing some triangulation here. So I don't have really the ability to tell who the people are. But like on my satellite show and all my local shows, the callers were like legendary. As sort. They were absolutely part of the show and they were great like individual personalities yeah. themselves it wasn't just and it wasn't just like radio caller personality stuff it was like fascinating human beings right and i'm down to give them rope and give them a little time okay to tell so how did okay is. how did you get fascinating human beings to call into your show how, what, i'm sure you have theories as to why i'm sure it's circular i could guess what happened there but i'm curious from your perspective what happened where suddenly because you know most people look at sports radio and like oh my god callers you know click i'm gone I don't, I don't believe that, but because uh, I think a great host can make anything great. But what made them great? How, what about your show made callers great? Well, I think for some people, it was, I think there was a certain segment of people who felt like they hadn't heard somebody who kind of spoke the way that they spoke on the radio. And that's not, and to be clear, that's not specifically a race sort of thing. Like the country white dudes on the dirt roads, the guys from West Virginia would call up and feel the same exact way. And then... You know, once you've opened the door to a certain thought process, I think that's a little broader than what's normal. Then you have a different set of people who call who give a different set of ideas, you know, so you get that part. The other one, I took one of the Myers-Briggs tests one time and they said that my personality type attracted interesting personality types. Now, there is a bit of pseudoscience involved in that. But when I read that for the first time, I was like, maybe that's why I get these guys who call in to the radio show. Like, I don't have a great understanding of it, but I mean, not I mean. These are guys that they call regularly enough and I like can hang out with them, you know, like and I don't mean like hypothetically speaking. I mean, like, hey, I'm in your city. You want to go kick it? And they wind up being like good people. We talk like we know each other. So I think a part of it is that if you can establish a a level of familiarity with people, then when they call you, they will speak to you like you're familiar as opposed to speaking to you like they're on the radio. All right. Here's Owen Murphy, the program director. I've I've, I've programmed two stations. So you probably don't know me. So you don't know that. Um, Tell me the general format for how you set up a show. All right. And my then, general and then I'm going to kneecap it. Sure. My general setup, um I listen to the things that the data people will tell you. So the top of the hour, the data you need people? like Yeah, you know, like the people like when we had when I worked at uh, the station in Raleigh, they were very clear to us about who's there at the top of the hour, who's there at the bottom of the hour, you know, like what the audience is that's coming in at points in time and okay, Well, hang on. So so and when when they would describe the type of audience, what were they describing exactly? More so size than anything else. And so, like, if I'm coming at the top of the hour, the best topic I've got is coming at the top of the hour. Yep. The first segment is going to be me. Like, that is that is what it's going to be. The people, I think, who are coming to listen to a radio show are coming to see whoever the name is that's on the marquee. So the first segment, I am going with whatever that topic is. If you don't have a topic to start your show that you can talk about for 11 minutes, then chances are this show is going to, like, peter out as it goes. I'm coming off the top with that topic. If I've got something that's good enough to carry over into something else, maybe I wind up doing that. But I would rather do a show that is condensed around angles of a big topic rather than try to go and do just a whole bunch of different things when you have it. So, uh, for example, the Thursday night game with the uh, with Washington and the Giants, you have the game itself is a topic. You have topics that surround both teams. So if I'm doing a national show, I've got the room to talk about those teams individually if I want to. I've got the quarterback if I want to. So if I'm doing a three-hour show, it's just a matter of figuring out, okay, what of these are legitimately compelling to where when people tune in at different times or even if they're listening the whole time, how can I give them something different even if it's based around the same topic of the day? Um, If I'm doing a guest, and I do more guests now than I used to just because I do more work the rest of the day, so I do kind of need that help to get through. I used to go literally, I could go a week and a half at a time doing radio without a guest. Um, <laughs> because locally, the guest that I could get was not necessarily going to be a better on-air product than I was. Yeah. So, you know, it wasn't just going to be I'm going to do a guest just because I need this time off or just because it's somebody else. Like, there has to be a value added to the guest, whether it's the information or the personality, there has to be a value added. So if I've got a guest on a topic that can inform on the topic better than I can, then I'm bringing that person in probably on a half hour segment just because I have hard outs on the 15 segments. And I don't want to cut somebody off if they call late or whatever it is. I don't want to have to cut them off in the middle of an answer or anything like that. So top of the hour, I'm coming with me. On the 
45, it's normally some lighthearted fare, something that is not necessarily the biggest why, topic. Why do you do that? Why? Why? Because you're, what you're doing is what everyone does. And here, so think about the audience for a second. People listen on average. They say, t- Nielsen, Nielsen tells us 10 minutes at a time, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and people who are coming in, why do the people at 45 deserve a lesser goofy topic as opposed to the people listening at the top? Well, and, you, and you said earlier that what you do is you like to take big stories and find right. different tangents off of them. So why, right. are you, why are you going goofy at the same time? It's like you're essentially people who don't want goofy know not to listen to your show at that time every single yep. day. But to be clear, there's a good chance they're going to get goofy at the top also. A different, <laughs> a different brand of goofy. But you know, you, you were, saying, you were right. saying a lighthearted story. That, that's kind of what right. you're... And everyone does the exact same thing. And it makes right. it, I, there's not a lot of hair left. There's a bald spot back here. And that's, this is the reason why. Because all these rules and formulas and the same old crap that everyone does all the time. After a while, it just gets on my nerves. Right. And you know what? I think there's something to what you're saying. I agree. But for me, my thought process on that being. So, for example, the story that we just had a couple of days ago about the mascot for the Vikings, the motorcycle guy asking for right, asking for twenty thousand dollars. That is an absolutely fantastic topic. Like, why not lead with it then? Well, the reason I'm not leading with it, this is this is my thinking. And you let me know, because I, I feel on this that I agree with you about people and their rigidity on some of those rules, but yeah. I always tell my bosses I'm not an artist, I'm an employee. And I feel as though that with the general audience that is listening, yeah, yeah. I can draw them in on the topic that they came to look for, and I can keep them around and give them a chance to see this other part. I think it's easier for me to lead them in with what's big and then show them what the next level of things is behind that. Well, that makes it's sense. easier yeah. for me to do that yeah. than the other way around. It, it makes sense to lead with big. I just, I, well, I guess what I'm saying is that, um, so if, I, I would guess that, here's what most radio shows do. They, they start off with a monologue. Uh, and I, I, I wrote this one of my recent blogs. I start with a monologue. <laughs> then you have uh, calls on the monologue. Then you have a guest on a different subject. Then you have the lighthearted. If, if, if your show is four segments, then mm-hmm. the fourth segment is the lighthearted one. Right. Uh, and uh, to me, why have rules as to how you're doing your show, how you're planning your show? If the first thing should be calls, then you should be doing calls. If the first thing should be a big opinion, then you should be doing big opinion. If the first thing should be a guest, then you should be doing a guest. Whatever it is, I don't know what right. that is. You know, but... Uh, all these rules that we put in place, I think, hinder us. And um, this, I'm trying to slowly. I'm making. I'm not. Gonna, I don't have a question coming out of this. I'm just making yeah. a statement. Uh, we set these rules, and I think we limit ourselves by setting these rules. Right. I do. I do think there's something to that. Now, let me give you a counterpoint on that. As I, I worked as a music critic for a long time, so I tend to do a lot of music examples on things. Right. So take. I I put the Beatles in this category and I put outcasts in a very similar category, which is these groups that managed to expand the idea of what was possible within a pop construct. Right. Sure. But the reason that I think that those groups managed to get a certain level of rope on that is by and large, the meter was familiar. You're going to have a four on the floor time on it. Right. There's the, the, the structure of it. The hook is going to be catchy, all of these things. But if you, you, you can be bound by those rules, but you can have wild creativity yeah. in between those things. And so I think for me, building around the structure, I can still give the creativity and difference around if, you know, with that structure in place. Yep. Um, but as of now, I don't have like a great way necessarily to do better. But I'll give you an example. The show I did last night while Washington and the Giants were playing, I'm on at nine o'clock. Of course, the game is going on. So the big topic would be the game. But what topic do we do? Robert Griffin's father driving 115 miles an hour in the state of Virginia when everybody knows that in the state of Virginia, you're going to get pulled over for driving one mile an hour over the speed limit. And that effectively became me and my producer, who is from Virginia, trading our stories about the time (laughs) that we got pulled over in Virginia. And then people like taking it's one thing to take calls on who do you think should have got the ball? It's another thing to take calls on. Tell me about that time you got pulled over. I love it. That's fantastic. Right. Right. You see what I mean? Have you ever driven that fast? Um, Maybe. I haven't. <laughs> Honestly, I, the, the only time I've driven 115 was actually very recently, but I was uh, I got a BMW i8 to drive for an afternoon, yeah. and I figured if I didn't drive 115 miles an hour in that, that I was cheating myself. Yeah. But that's the way, so I get exactly what you're saying, but I think that, and I think to a degree, if someone wants to argue that this is my personal arrogance, this is fair, um, I think that even within some of those rigid structures, I think that if you have a creative enough outlook on the topic, then you can go and you can give those people what it is that they're looking for while still, you know, doing these other things. Yeah, yeah. I like it. I think that's a really funny angle on it. I, I, until you said I didn't know that he had been busted for driving 150. He got 10 days in jail. They got 10 days in jail, by the way. He's a 
former military man, right? Yes, he is. Yeah. Yes, he is. He got, that's what I figured happened. It was 6.15 in the morning. He was leaving Hampton, going back toward Richmond, and Hampton's a military area. He must have told somebody he was going to be back at home by 8 or whatever time it was he said that he was going to be. And they got him. But then Jason Worth got five days in jail for reckless driving in Virginia like that. Like, that's just what happens in Virginia. And so those of us who drive on the East Coast, we all know when you get to Virginia, slow down. Well, what's, the safe, what's the safe miles per hour one can drive and, and not get pulled over? Because I'm visiting Virginia. The limit. The um, limit. The limit. The limit. Put it on cruise control on the limit. Golly. Yeah, man. Yeah, see, and you learn, see, just like that, it becomes an educational segment. Like, it, it becomes all of these sorts of things. So, yeah, I agree. We do have too many rules on this. And for me, it's a little tricky because I do a one person show. And the thing about a one person show is it is more difficult to make transitions to different topics within a segment. Well, so that, okay, so that's, I was going to ask you about this. Uh, in some ways, your show, uh, because of, by virtue of who you are, how you think, how you approach things, you know, the uh, economic, how many, you have three degrees in economics or something that effect, yes. which I love that. Um, uh, so you, so you, it's different in that regard, but it's, there's some sameness there as well in that it's conversation. It's you sharing your thoughts and things. Uh, it strikes me, and I haven't listened a ton. I've only listened to a few different podcasts, but um you don't showbiz your show up a lot. There's not like the bells and whistles. There's not um, music beds or things of that nature. Why? Well, as of right now, that's as much a logistical thing as anything else. Mm -hmm. um, when I did radio every day, I have my own and I go through, I went through and I cut up all the sound off the movies myself, run the DVD player off the laptop and everything on things that I wanted to put in there and have on deck and have people be able to do like as they go. Hmm. Um, Right now, since my producer works another job, it has not allowed us to really get the chemistry right back on having those things because I do have a framework of things that I do kind of like to include. I, like When I did a radio in, on series, for example, I did a segment I think I'm going to bring back called the Old Soul Pro where I'd use old R&B tracks as advice for people <laughs> in sports in any sort of way and run that underneath as a music bed and kind of talk over it and turn it up at times where it had to go. Tell um, me, so give me an example of a song you used on a story you used. That's hilarious. Oh, so this wound up being an erroneous prediction, but there was a point where Rick Pitino had lost Marcus Teague in recruiting to John Calipari, and it was somebody that uh, Pitino had been in on for years, and then Calipari came in at the end. And this is right after Pitino had his situation in the restaurant with the extortion case and everything. And so... I did the Manhattans, let's just kiss and say goodbye. Just about how, look, you got all the way to this. This is just the point that you've ended with. It's easier just to walk away. I know it's going to hurt. I know it's everything else. Uh, you know, so we could do those sorts of things. But I, I would it. veer, like if I would veer off of sports, this is not the same feature, but it was similar. You remember Mark Sanford, the governor in South Carolina? Who, oh, yes. You know, so he had those love letters that he had written to his woman. So when I was doing local radio in Raleigh, I would read those love letters with R. Kelly's Bump and Grind playing underneath. In the <laughs> beginning of it, you know, it's my mind's telling me no. And, you know, and then we start. So that's the idea. It's Mark Sanford and it's R. Kelly and it fits both of them. And, you know, you can kind of go from there. So I don't mind doing those things, but they have to be very, very organic. Like it has to it has to feel very right in that moment. Uh, we used to do a segment local called the Big Dummy of the Week with the Sanford and Son music underneath that is a little trickier to do national because people take these things more personally and they're more likely to hear you. So calling somebody a big dummy doesn't quite go over the same way. Um, and we also did, and I don't think I can get away with this um, on ESPN. You could, hang on, you could do big dummy. If you've got like Fred G. Sanford and the, and yeah. the G stands for glory, glory, hallelujah. Yes. You yes, could sir. absolutely... Because it's so goofy. How could someone get offended by that? You know, and you're right about that. And I've been thinking about, there's just been a lot of those things now that, now that this is finally in place and kind of going to go the way that I want it to, yeah. it's now a matter for me. These last six months, I think I've done a pretty bare bones sort of show. Yeah. And I think there's potential for more on that. And now it's just a matter of getting back. It's been six years, I mean, five years since I've done like really day-to-day -day radio. So now it's a place to getting back to figuring out what the rhythm of those things is. I have a producer I trust to come up with these things yeah. um, and do more of them. So like, yeah, as of right now, it's a bit more of a straight ahead thing. Um, there will be more involved in it, but as it is straight ahead, as I've got it right now, I think I can still do a pretty, I think mean, people are going to show, they're not going to stick around for the bells and the whistles necessarily. They're going to stick around here for me. So also very early in the show, I do kind of like to establish the personality. So when we get to four o'clock, it's going to be a new audience. Um, I just got an email that was asking if we had anything special playing for the first show. And I was like, no, nah, we got to act like we've been here already. 
you know, because the people who are tuning in, most people don't read press releases. You know, most people don't have any idea that this is the first day of the show. They just know they turn it on the radio and they want there to be radio there. That's well, that's smart because the other thing is in six months, you'll have a whole whole bunch of new audience that has right. never tuned in before either. So you may as well like, act like you've been there and just go. Right. And we got a full day of NFL football. Like there's bigger things. Like this show will largely be about me, but they're coming for the football. They'll right. stay. They'll stick around if they like me, but they're coming for the football. Yeah. So uh, teasing, important, not important? I do think it is important. Um, I think it just makes things easier for the listener. Do you do um, it? I do, religiously, in fact. I do it in large part because it gives me a rhythm on how to end the breaks. Um, and also just there are some people, and even if it's only one, that hears, oh, you might be talking about this, let me stick around. Or, you know, let me bring some, Like, I don't see any pain in it. I think the problem with teasing for a lot of people is they're not very good at it. No! You know, get and out so, of here. Yeah, so their teases are corny, right? And if you don't like doing cor- if you don't want to do a corny tease, I understand that. Don't do a corny tease. Like that's the option. Don't be corny. But I don't. I I believe that it is important for the host to make things easy on the listener. Yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, give me an example of a great tease. How do you write a great tease? All right. Let me think. Let me think. Think of a good. Let me think of a topic that I could be doing here today. Oh, if so. If I were going to do that tease on Robert Griffin's father. Oh, that's a when, good place to start. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. When we come back, you think things are going bad for Robert Griffin the third? Would you believe that his daddy just got sent to jail? Well, no, see, no, no. But you see, you're, you're giving away the punchline, aren't you, by saying... Uh, but but I'm not telling you what he's going to jail for. Yeah, yeah. You know? I think I would have done something like... Uh, um, uh, well, how, you got me. I lost my train of thought. So... I think I would have said, you will not believe how fast he was going and where he was doing it or something to that yeah. effect, you know? Yeah, that yeah. might be, it might be. I think part of it needs to be informational. Another part of it is that the thing you say is punchy and funny enough that yeah, people yeah. will be like, okay, this is the preview for what it is, you know? But I, I readily admit that when I started doing radio, I was working with a consultant very much. So I am a bit programmed into the things that they need because I'm like, okay, if I can do all the stuff I want to do around all the things that you need, then it's a fair compromise. And I think that most radio hosts are jerks and therefore need to do whatever it is that they want to do because they refuse to compromise. That, that was a reasonable thing you just said right there. I'm not sure I've ever... <laughs> no, that's not true. Um, all right. Uh, if... Uh dumbest thing a program director's ever said to you? You know what's funny? Oh, I've never really had to deal with a program director. Wow. When I worked when I worked in Raleigh, our program director was on air, and he would come in, you know, it would, but he was working on air at that time. He was more an on-air guy than a suit. So we would talk about things that he was very helpful. You know, I never had anything that Adam ever told me that I didn't think was helpful. My program director in Toronto, when I worked at the score, he gave me a decent bit of rope. The only thing he did ask me once if I would be willing to do a sponsorship for a company called Fresh Balls that you would rub onto your testicles to keep them um, to keep them cool in the summer. And I had to explain. I'm using them right think. now. And I'm telling you this, right, it's amazing, yeah. actually. The product yeah, is I had incredible. To, yeah, I had to tell him. I was like, if you think that um, I'm putting my brand anywhere near their balls, you're crazy. <laughs> like, that was, that, was, that, was, that was not it. But he, by and large, it was a really creative place. And they let guys in the score. It was a place called The Score in Canada. Now there are a lot of people on TV in a lot of places that used to work at that company. Adnan Burke is an example of this guy. Uh, Kyle Edwards at the WWE. Renee wow. Young at the WWE. It was a lot of different people that wound up getting a lot of really good jobs after that. And they kind of let us do whatever we needed to do. So I've heard the nightmares about programming directors, and I really haven't had to deal with that. Like, I'm having to get used to ESPN asking us to send them a rundown before the show because I'm like, we'll get a show together. Just let us do it. You know, like, I'm, I'm having to get used to somebody actually wanting to know what we're going to talk about. So uh, they, you send them a rundown. Do you ever get feedback saying, eh, I don't know about that? Actually, I don't, and I'm kind of surprised that this hasn't happened because the word weed comes up in the rundown fairly often, and not once <laughs> has anybody like come and shut it down. Like I did a segment last night about, um, and I did this at the 15, not the 45, but um, <laughs> Marley, uh, Marley Coffee, Rohan Marley, Bob Marley's son, has a coffee company, and they have established a partnership with the Denver Broncos for the Mile High Blend. Interesting. 
Hey, and I was like, yeah. imagine all that money the NFL has to leave on the table. They got this prime real estate of the Mile High brand in the state that legalized marijuana. Yeah. Like, think about all the places that they could wind up going, or the Broncos, how they explain that this isn't really about weed. I could just understand how it is that you would believe that this is tied in to weed and the such things, you know, because weed right. is like the new gambling. It's legal and it's legal about as many places as gambling and about the same ways we understand that people do it. Yep. So it becomes a topic of conversation. Right. All right. So uh, speaking of your bosses at ESPN, this is a tweet from Amanda Gifford, uh, who is a program director there. Uh, and I used to work there, so she's an old friend. Um, and it's, it's, it says right here, it says uh, this tweet, my obsession with honey mustard pretzel pieces has reached a new low. So there you go right there. There's um, <laughs> this is who you're this is uh, who's leading you. So uh, good luck with Actually, that. Yeah, I, I just got an email from Amanda earlier today. We are in the process of getting to know each other a little better. And all she's asked as far as what she can do to help. You she's, know, she's so, aces, man. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me tell you just generally, like. I think that people have a bit of a perception about ESPN that I don't think is really quite fair in terms of how restrictive they are on content. Not restrictive at all when I worked there. No, no, I've never yeah. had anybody tell me I couldn't say anything. I mean, listen to Dan's show. You know, they've turned over, know. The, uh, you know, they've given him the keys. And I think there's some people that were worried at oh. first, but it's not nearly, I think people would get more rope on some things if they like tried and had a basis for yeah. some of the. All right. So I'm going to ask you a Dan Levitard question. Do you have a secret heroin addiction? <laughs> you know the story? No, I, just can't, I just can't gain weight <laughs> do you know the story behind that i don't know that he, he asked david robinson that question oh wow. i can see that <laughs> oh i laughed out loud that was great all right quick hits here um greatest comedian of all time this is important all right greatest comedian of all time i would say you've got that is a richard pryor eddie murphy there's only one uh, answer there's only one answer I, oh it's a dilemma i am going to go with richard pryor thank you that's eddie the right murphy. answer everyone else says george carlin and i want to stab them with a fork no, when they Car do it carlin's up there the thing is richard's the best writer that there's been like eddie murphy's the most talented comedian that there's ever been because he could be anything you wanted him to be but just in terms of understanding the nuances of funny and making it look like you're not even trying richard pryor yeah uh, I'm just going to say a name. You just react. Colin Cowherd. He is very good at his job. Fair enough. Uh, greatest quarterback ever. Greatest quarterback ever. I will go with the Joe Montana. Very good. Uh, least favorite word. Whew. My least favorite word is anything like darn. Like if you're gonna cuss, cuss. Yeah. Like any, anything that involves half stepping. Those are those are the words I hate. Could uh, could you see having cussing on radio? If the FCC um, unfortunately, there's a reason why we can't because some people just aren't very good at. It. Well, I don't know. We're, we're adults now. Or, you know, the, I think we can have cussing on radio. That's my opinion. But yeah, I think, you know, I think we could. But I think there's always the one guy who just don't know where to stop, and sure. he messes it up for everybody. It's kind of like my argument about why I don't want them to use the N word in Empire or Blackish. It's not about to start. It's about where it ends. Right. Uh, toughest around the horn foe. Pablo, no question. Why? Pablo Torre, because he's so smart. Yep. He's so smart and knows so many things and has an amazing gift for giving you all the Harvard information without sounding like a jerk from Harvard. All right, so last question, I think. Five years from now, where would you like this radio show to be? Five years from now, I would like this radio show to be on the air. And, <laughs> but, but the reason I say that is I think that in a lot of ways – the notion of time has become a bit agnostic and the ways that people are able to access content. They have so many different ways. I will always be able to do a show that reaches the people that I want to reach mm -hmm. the big, massive, gigantic audience that is in really ESPN's interest. And they have the mechanisms to go and get those. But if I, I have a radio show that I, I love doing radio, like I like doing television. I love doing radio. Why? So, um, I think it's more personal. I think it's a more intimate environment. I don't have all these people that are in my way, and it allows me to really tap into some of the nuances. Like on television, we got like a minute to talk about something. Max, there's so many nuances to all these different topics that on radio you can roam, and it's not as sterile as TV, and TV requires such a level of perfection. And with writing, there are people always over you looking at what your little mistakes were and everything else. Radio is life. Like It feels much more like the rhythm of life. So if I've got a radio show and a decent check to go with it, I'll work the rest out later. Pamani Jones, I am really excited about what the future holds for this radio, for you and this radio show. I think you have an opportunity to do really great things. I think you've got the brain, the smarts, the funny. 
Uh, you got uh, bits, the whole thing. I can't wait to see what you do. I'm excited. Well, I appreciate it. In fact, I just, um, I'm getting emails in now. I got five DJs and producers. I got one of them, Amanda works with Dr. Dre, another guy's been working with Rich Homie Quan, a couple other people where they're putting together my bump music folder wow. because I always say, I want to make ev evocative radio rather than provocative radio. Like I want this to feel like something. Like when the, when the music comes out of the break, I want it to feel like something. And then when I start talking, like it's not just going to be a matter. I'm not here to make you mad. It's like I'm here to talk about these things. So I want to do a show that really just has a feel to it. That when you get into it, like it, it builds a community around the fact that you like this feeling that you've got when you're listening to this show. So I really think that once we get this started, I have the good fortune of working with the first producer that I ever work with. Um, we have the not so insignificant fact that this is a national afternoon drive show with a 35 year old black dude as the host with 30, 33 year old black dude as a producer. Like, I mean, think about it, how often, and none of us play ball. You know, none of us are athletes. Like this is, we've, we've got an opportunity to do something that really has never been done before and to prove something I think the programming directors miss out on all the time is that the audience isn't afraid of the black guys. Like they will be able to see that our lives are very similar to their lives and we will be able to relate to each other's experiences through these sports. And I think we'll be able to laugh together on all these things. I think people will be asking me, I've never heard this song before. Where can I find it? And then next thing you know, they're down a Van Morrison rabbit hole, right? Like all these opportunities are here to do. So when the, when this comes around, I've got, I think I got the support from the people in the background. They'll leave me alone enough to do a good show. So I'm, I am personally really, really looking forward to doing this. Like you're probably surprised to hear me sound so excited because I rarely do that on a regular basis. Well you, you should, well, you should be excited. It's a, it's a national radio show, like you said, Afternoon Drive on the East Coast. My God, what an incredible opportunity. Um, yeah. I, I'd be jacked if I were you. Now, we're about, to, we're about to, I mean, I really think, honestly, that there are a lot of people who only kind of know me from television who have never heard these radio shows. And I think they're going to be very, very, I think they'll be surprised by the, the, the vibe of it all. Because, again, it's not television anymore. I think they'll be surprised by that. And I think that they'll be surprised really by the knowledge that Shannon and I have about sports and the fact we're not really trying to reinvent the wheel as much as we're trying to make this a much better wheel. Very good. Bamani Jones, thank you. Hey, man, thank you. I really appreciate it. We have to do this again down the line, you know, assuming that, you know, they don't put me off of this thing because you can't really have sports radio chat if I'm not on sports radio. That's right.